This is Bob Fass, and this is Radio Nameable. Hello? Hello? What a voice. You should be on the air. Thank you. You are. I'm on the air. I would call it the stream of consciousness radio. Never know what's going to come next. This is Psychedelic Radio in New York City. WLSD. Bob used the mixing console the way an artist uses paint. Hello, you're on the air. How many people can talk at once? Uh, all of them. Hundreds and hundreds of people came up there, you know, thinkers, writers, comedians, poets. You know, the appearances of Dylan when it was off the wall and nobody expected him to come in. There was a scene developing. It was very exciting. The WBAI was the pulse of the movement, and Bob was key. Tear gas canisters are raining right through the crowd. People began to call the station with reports. Yeah, Bob? Yes? They've got a girl right now, and he's got her by her hair, and he's dragging her out. These were like citizen journalists. It was sort of the forerunner of Twitter, in a way. Bob represents the ideal of absolute free speech. I'm having handcuffs put on because I said I do not want to leave. Good show. Hurry home. To the extent that some of the other radio forms are as good as they are is because of what Bob Fass did and what Bob Fass continues to do. Are you BAI? Hello. Hello. Everybody is speaking to all New York, New York. I had Paul on my radio show last week, and I got to interview him, and hadn't seen the movie, so this was this was really awesome. That's an amazing film. Thanks a lot. Absolutely amazing. How did how did that happen? How did you get interested in him? Were you a listener? No, no, no. I, um, I, I mean, I listened to. I mean, I, I, I've been in New York for a little while, so I'd heard WBAI. But um, uh, Matthew, in the introduction, mentioned a previous movie I made about this Greenwich Village psychedelic folk duo called the Holy Model Rounders, who, um, you know, whenever they started in the early '60s, and they were on radio nameable uh, quite often, and. Uh, and continued, you know, while we were making the film, they were on Radio Nameable, and that's how I first heard of um, one of the members of that band describe Bob and describe the show, and, you know, it's like something that, you know, unlike any other radio show that's, you know, then or now, and um, so that was the first introduction, and then um, and then we, we, uh, we learned about his archive, because people would talk about how word, you know, word got around that he's sitting on all this stuff, and all this great music, so uh, it just seemed like a pretty natural, um, sort of a natural subject for a documentary. I mean, radio's challenging, because it's oral, but we knew that um, he, you know, he's covered so much, and he's lived such an interesting life, and had such a uh, pretty, you know, colorful and eventful radio career that um, there was a film to be made, so. There was so much footage. I mean, between, as you said, it's, it's because it's radio, it's obviously mostly oral, but um, there was also incredible amount of footage um, for you to have to go through. How, do, how does one sit there and edit down all, I mean, that's an amazing accomplishment. Well, I mean, it wasn't just me. I mean, there was, there was a whole team. We, we had a, a really talented editor uh, named Greg Wright, and you saw it in, the, in just now, at that, that scene at the end, where you know, we were starting the movie, and Mitch Blank, who's on the Staten Island Ferry, kind of leading all of the volunteers, uh, Bob introduced us to Mitch, and Mitch says, you have to... You, you know, and we knew this, that you have to know the material. You have to know what's in his collection. And a team of maybe 60 or so people were assembled, uh, many of which didn't know each other. Uh, you know, age, like, you know, all young, older, um, and everyone came together to take the material out of Bob's house, organize it. It was a really amazing thing. I mean, I'm, just, you know, it's 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 still very moving to me to think about that because everyone really liked each other, and we knew that it was doing it for a very good reason, um, not just for the movie, but to hopefully find the end result will be to find a home for Bob's archive. So, um, so that's kind of a long-winded answer. We had a lot of help. 
I, I have to say that I was a little bit nervous when I saw the boxes down in the basement yeah. being through, right? Oh, they're not, they're not there anymore. <laughs> they're, um, that was, um, so during Sandy, they were not there. They're in a climate controlled uh, space in, um, in Maryland. So I'm very glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was some incredible interviews that that were um, um, on on well tape of one form or another. There was you know Timothy Leary and Abby Hoffman and um, I, I mean it just an incredible amount of people. Who were you most excited about? What interviews were you most excited about seeing, hearing? Oh, um, that's a really hard question. I think. It's hard to, and picking a favorite is almost unfair because there are so many great ones that, um, Paul Krasner was someone who um, we actually interviewed twice. Uh, first time, we, he lives in Desert Hot Springs in, in, um, in California and, um, and we went out to interview him and we got off the plane and we, we were doing a few other work out there, some other work out there and um, he's like, I have to tell you, we called him when we got there, he's like, I, ha I hate to tell you this, but I've fallen and I have a, a scab, and it's in the most, the worst possible place, and it really, you know, it looked like a, a Hitler mustache. And, I mean, it, it was really bad. And so we're like, we thought, well, you know, maybe, well, let's just do the interview, maybe people won't notice, they'll concentrate on what you're saying, and then, so we did it, we got back in the edit room, we're like, there's no way. So, um, uh, so we went back again and interviewed him twice, but, um, you know, he's, he's another person that's like so funny and so gracious and, and has lived, uh, you know, an equally uh, fascinating life. So I, you know, if I had to pick a favorite, I would say Paul Krasner was, you know, both times was really tremendous. And Bob Fass, how was he to work with? Was he a nice guy? Good, he good. Looks, he looks like a wonderful man. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a nice guy. I mean, he was, um, I mean, it's, you have to... I mean, you have to imagine, it's a, it's a pretty, you know, it's a, it's a lot of, he's, he's putting a lot of faith in us, particularly opening up his, his house and his, um, his personal artifacts, which are very, which are valuable, um, not only culturally, but to him on a personal level of how long he's held on to them. Um, you know, he put a lot of trust in us, and he is, he was a great subject. I mean, he was an actor, so we would do stuff like, um, film him driving into the studio, and I think in his mind it was like, you know, we were, uh, he was, he was like an actor in our, our TV show, and, and um, you know, you would shake our hands, it was great working with you tonight, and you know, that kind of thing, but, um, uh, but he was, he was great. Is he really still not getting paid? He is not getting paid, and I mean, he hasn't been paid for, I mean, since 1980, 30 years, so. Wow. I guess once you get addicted to radio, it's really hard to give it up. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure if, uh, if an opportunity came up that would pay him, he would, uh, he would, take he it. would, he would <laughs> eagerly leave uh, WBAI. And but not something. radio. No, no, he, he, I, that's what he does. He, he loves it. I think we should take some questions from the audience if anybody. Yes. Wow, thank you. Are you I, I have to, are you, are you, you contributed to our Kickstarter campaign. Thank you very much. So, you know, when you, when you asked if going through everything and uh, when I said we had a lot of help, that's, that's, that's really what I meant. So thank you. It means a lot. How did you find out about the Kickstarter campaign? I 
don't, I don't recall. I mean, I think Kickstarter was the first one we did, but uh, maybe through, um, through our website, but... Uh, But I mean, were you a listener about FAST, or how did you come across it? Do you still uh, have those tapes? <laughs> oh, well. Well, well, <clears throat> well, thank you. I mean, we're, we're eternally, eternally grateful for your support, so thanks. Thanks. They, uh, th there were two sources for the for the Grand Central tapes, and they were very hard. Uh, pretty one was really hard to track down. The one that was in color, and it's a filmmaker named Marvin Fishman, who was part of um, a collective called Newsreel, and he um, he didn't really do that for any sort of film, but he um, he just went there and, and had a camera and shot all this footage and. Um, uh, we, it was just through, a, we did a lot of detective work, we did a lot of um, placing calls out to, you know, were you at these events, and not, not really to um, your standard archival sources, but to people who just, ordinary New Yorkers who might have shown up with a camera. So he, you know, he falls into that category. The, uh, the black and white was a filmmaker in uh, uh, Vancouver, Named Peter Davis, not the Peter Davis who did um, uh, Hearts and Hearts and Minds, but um, a different filmmaker. And he, um, same thing, just showed up with a black and white camera, and uh, that he was a little easier to find. But um, but yeah, it took some work to locate a lot of that footage. So I'm I'm glad you noticed that. Right here. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, we had, we, we did. I mean, we actually had a much, much longer version than this when we, uh, kind of the first, our first draft, so to speak. And, um, and we got more into that, but it's just, it's really complicated and it's very easy to um, kind of, you know, the film's called Radio Nameable. It's about Bob Fass. And it's, it's really easy once you get into all the, um, the, the turmoil at the station and the politics within the station to kind of get off of that track. And um, we just felt like it was, um, it was just too much. And it, you almost need your own film for that because whatever, it's, uh, it's, it's really complicated. And the station's, you know, it's a mess right now. I mean, they're, they're way behind in their bills and, uh, but it's, you know, it's still in the air. And he's, he'll be on tomorrow night. He's doing something for Bob Dylan's 72nd birthday. I think he's having, um, some Bob Dylan imitators come up, and um, so, um, but yeah, it was. It, it, we did. We did try, and um, we just felt that it, it wouldn't. It wouldn't have worked. And he was compared to to Twitter. Can you explain that? Well, I mean, I think in, in the scene in Grand Central Station is a good, um, or the fly-in really, I mean, is a good example of that because, you know, I mean, for one thing, there just wasn't as much stuff there was in the media. I mean, it was just very, very, you know, there were only a few TV networks and there wasn't much else on the FM dial. And, um, and so, and his phone lines were open. I mean, anyone could call. So it was a place where people could share information openly and, you know, you had to avoid, avoid a few words, but more or less you could talk about whatever you wanted. So um, um, I think as, as far as being kind of a switchboard and a hub, um, you, can, you can draw some parallels there. I'm curious as a radio person, um, it, it, did, did people curse on the show? How did they avoid that? Did oh they yeah, have a it still happens all the time. Did they have I mean, a seven second delay? And he does, and, um, and sometimes he'll just have to let it go, and you know, particularly late at night, he gets a musician, right. or people call in, and they're just like, I mean, that's the last thing they're thinking about. But, um, but yeah, I mean, he takes it seriously. I mean, you could really get in a lot of trouble, mm -hmm. and you could, um, um, I mean, you could, you, the license could be in jeopardy. But, um, but yeah, it happens all the time. Right here. It, it may be a mess now, but it was a really great station in the 60s, uh, mid, mid and late 60s and early 70s. How easy or hard was it for you to find all those contemporaries, Louis Lester and Steve Post and Larry Josephson, and get them to talk to you? Pretty easy. Uh, Larry and Steve actually live in, in our neighborhood, so um, they, they were easy. And, um, How did you um, Bob, Bob's still in touch with them, so he just gave us their, their phone numbers, and, um, and they've been out. Steve and Larry and Bob have appeared together, I think, for three or four screenings so far. So, um, um, and, and Larry, in particular, has been just amazing with us. But um, everyone was pretty... No, I'm trying to think if there's anyone that was hard to track down, and not, not really. I mean, we tried to... Um, we really wanted to interview Pablo Guzman, um, from the scene in 1977, and he had some health issues at the time, and he just couldn't get it together to do an interview. But he was hard to reach, because he he's kind of a busy guy. But um, I think, for the most part, we were able to get everyone that we, we wanted to talk to uh, agreed to be in the film, so. How many people out there are, are familiar with Bob Fast before tonight and were listeners? Wow. This film has gotten amazing reviews. It's, um, can I just read a couple of them really quickly? Um, I think it was New York uh, Daily News said, a treasure trove of both visual and oral footage that makes this terrific doc a keeper. Uh, Time Out New York said, as haunting and as heroic as anything you'll see on the big screen this year. Uh, I understand that the film is coming out on DVD? Yes, uh, it's going to be, I think in late July, it's going to be on all the um, on-demand platforms, a lot of which I'd never heard of before. And, um, <laughs> um, but that's, you know, like Hulu and um, iTunes, stuff like that. And then September 10th is the DVD 
and so it'll be on Netflix. So after September, after September 10th, it'll be available all over the place. So, is it playing in the meantime other places around? Is it playing at, at uh, Jacob Burns? You know? Uh, no, and it's it's it, we have a few more screenings in the in the coming months, and um, but we've um, we've shown it uh, quite. Uh, you know, quite a bit in the last year, so it's been it's been great. Other local screenings, at sort of Manhattan. Uh, not at the moment. Maybe something before the DVD comes out. Uh, we might do some sort of event where we'll have Bob appear and do something. But um, if you go to um, if anyone if anyone's on Facebook, we have a Facebook page to search for Radio Nameable Movie. We have a website, RadioNameableMovie dot com, and we're you know, we keep, we'll keep everyone act, up, updated and we're pretty active on all that. And also, um, what we do on our website, and we're, revamp, we're revamping it at the moment, it'll be, um, it'll be a whole new website in the next few weeks, but, you know, in the movie, with the audio, we had to cut it up, so you're hearing just a couple minutes at a time, sometimes several seconds. Uh, we've taken some of the complete reels and just thrown them up on the website, so, you know, for example, there's a, um, like this pretty wild Tiny Tim appearance, and we just threw the whole thing <laughs> up there, um, and, then, uh, and, and more, and, and we're gonna try and get some more up soon, so, um, so if you find us there, we'll, um, you know, we, we try and keep it interesting. Is the Tiny Tim up there now? Yes, yeah. <laughs> no, no, he turns 80 next month. He loves it. He's um, he watches it. I mean, he's he's appeared with. Um, I mean, I've seen it many many times. So it's I don't always watch it, um, but he he sits through every screening that he appears with and appears at because he wants to see what the audience reaction is like. And um, he's been really supportive, and um, it's been great. I mean, he um, when we opened in in at uh, Film Forum in New York, he. Um, there was someone in the audience who raised their hand and said, um, you know, I was really, really debating whether to come tonight. I wasn't sure if I was going to do it. I kind of didn't want to because I've been listening to you for 30, 40 years, and I had no idea what you look like. <laughs> and, um, and so I didn't, I really didn't want to know. And then Bob's like, you know, are you, are you okay with this? He's like, yeah, I'm glad I came. So it was, um, but he's, he's had a lot of fun with it, and he's con reconnected with a lot of people uh, through the film. And um, so it's been, you know, it's been a great ride, and it's still, it's still happening, so. How, how did he react when you initially approached him? Um, he was, you and know. how did that happen? Was that a phone call, or? I just made a cold call, and, um, and someone gave me his, he's in, the, he's in the phone book, so it's not, he's pretty easy to reach. And, um. And it took about, a, I'd say about a year to fully gain their trust. So um, just spent a lot of time with them without a camera. We would make trips out to Staten Island and um, it just, you know, we just got to know them first and, and it, it worked out. Obviously. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering about the archive and if you know if, if anybody's planning to make other movies or films out of it. Um, I mean, not that I'm aware of. People have uh, actually. There's a couple of um, a couple of, uh, of reissues, music reissues that they're going to use some some stuff from his archive, and they'll come out in the next year, and uh, which is great. You'll get a few bucks from that, and and he does have. I don't know if you call it an agent, but someone who's overseeing his archive, trying to facilitate a sale. Um, there's been a few things that have just fallen through for, because it's a kind of tricky collection because it's, it's big and it's not just the audio, it's all the photos and the papers and um, it's just a pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty dense. And um, so, I don't know. I mean, he could, he could really use the money, so, um, He's hoping there'll be some sort of acquisition, but it's really hard. It's really, uh, it's, it's a pretty, um, 
it's it's I mean making movies is tough like that like the the special collections and archives and I don't know I mean it's that that to me seems like a whole other level so typically what does somebody do with an archive like that do you know well I mean I you know I don't I have a rough idea just by doing research but that's not my field so I don't know I mean I'm, I wouldn't be a, a good person to speak to that I'm but just wondering um, if it goes into a library oh sometimes I mean like I think that. it depends I mean sometimes uh, institutions will take something on and they'll sit you know they'll just sit on it for a while because they don't have the money to get it out there um, some places I visited um, Yale for example has is tremendous I mean it's very organized it's um, um, I, mean, I think I did do something with Benny Goodman's archive, and it was all there, and it was really easy, and um, um, and it's it's open to the public. So um, it's, I mean, I think it really, I think it depends, but it's funding is always an issue. I, I don't guess that BAI is going to buy it. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. But Pacifica does have an archive, and they're um, they're good. The the people who run it are. Um, uh, they've been really helpful to us, and, and they've got an uh, uh, just outstanding collection. And um, but it's the same as most other places; they just don't have money to to take something like this on. Most people aren't paid at the at the station, and. I think I think the vast majority of the programmers don't aren't paid at all. I mean, a lot of community and listener-supported stations are are like that. Um, and I don't know. I mean, there's been talk to get them some kind of a pension, but I mean, I think that's been in times when WBAI was a little more flush. And um, I mean, I think they can barely afford, or sometimes don't, pay their own staff. And it's. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't. I, I I can't really relate to why you would just keep doing it, but and and to deal with that year in, week in, week out. But um, um, I don't know. I think often they a, a show will get money from sponsors, but it doesn't sound like he has advertisers on the show. It doesn't sound like it could that could be a hard thing. show to attract. Yeah, attract advertisers too. Yeah. Any other questions for Paul tonight? No? Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Mercedes. Thank you all. Wonderful. Thanks for coming.